jump right in then. Why don't you tell listeners a little bit about your background and what got you interested in stress? All right. So, so background goes all the way back to, you know, being born and growing up in, in Iran, which was kind of war torn and revolution and all kinds of stuff. But uh, this one incident, my dad and I were traveling to through these remote villages in Iran and in this one village, very primitive, no, no motorized vehicles, no power lines, no plumbing. I mean, this, this is a, this is like going back a hundred to two, 300 years in time. Uh, this, in the village, this woman went into labor and she was in tremendous amount of pain and, and complications. No one knew what to do to help her. And there was only a midwife, no doctors, no hospitals. This midwife came over and uh, examined her and stood up, said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. There's no heartbeat. The baby is not alive and this lady's not going to make it. And she left. And I was, uh, you know, nine years old at the age of nine. I'm looking into the eyes of this young woman who was just told she's not going to live another few hours. And, and, um, knowing that she's going to probably suffer and hurt and slowly pass away in her husband's arms, I started to have this big panic attack where, you know, your chest feels tight and your heart's pounding, you're having trouble catching your breath and tears are coming down my face. And my dad saw me, he picked me up, he held me, he carried me out of there, he calmed me down. The two of us climbed down the mountain, we got in our car to drive home. And on the drive home, I said, dad, I don't want to feel like that ever again. Um, he said, what are you going to do about it? I said, I'll go be a surgeon. I'll be the best surgeon in the whole world or carry my medical bag with me everywhere I go. And I'm just going to save lives. And uh, 10 years passed. That was the plan. Uh, 10 years later, I was a student at George Washington University and I was planning to apply for early selection at medical schools and, and that, you know, go that way. And uh, my sophomore year, I went home for Christmas break. Uh, and we were living in the States at the time, my family also. And, and I walked into our house and my dad had this big giant neck brace on and he was under the influence of some heavy painkillers and he was literally limp and numb from the shoulders down. He couldn't lift his arms to even give me a hug to say hello. And, and we spent my Christmas break six, seven weeks going from doctor to doctor trying to figure out what is wrong with my dad. And every doctor we went to said, this is way beyond my scope. You got to go to this other doctor. Finally, we ended up in a neurosurgeon's office. And as you know, neurosurgeons operate on the spine. And um, this guy said, you needed surgery yesterday. Yeah, these bone spurs and degenerative changes, bulging discs, all this stuff. We're going to break and remove bones in the back of your neck and put rods on the sides and screw them into your neck, fuse your whole neck. You're never going to turn your head again. And you may not regain function of your hands. And we're hoping you have less pain. And there's a chance you're going to die because you're old. And I'm thinking, dad already doesn't do anything. He's, he sits all day and all night. He can't even lie down because there's too much pressure on his neck. He has to sleep sitting up and he can't use his hands. And, you know, my dad had a passion. You know how some people like to draw or paint or play musical instrument. Dad liked writing. He always wrote letters, jokes, poems, stories. And he couldn't even hold a pen. He couldn't work. He couldn't feed himself, dress himself. And uh, so, so it, you know, who he liked writing letters to was the president. The president of the U.S. got a letter from my dad like once, <laughs> a, week or once a month. Uh, dad didn't even speak that much English. I don't know how he did it. Anyways, we, um, we talked to two other neurosurgeons. All three said dad needed the surgery and it was going to be really dangerous. One of the last ones said, go and get your affairs in order. Come back in a week and we'll operate. And we got in a taxi to go home. And I was sitting in the back of the taxi carrying all of dad's x-rays and MRIs and CTs and medical records. And, and I looked over at my dad and he had his neck brace on and I could tell he was, he was in pain. He was just cringing. Looking in his eyes, I could tell he just didn't want to live anymore. And in that moment, I got transported back to that village, watching the woman die in her husband's arms. And I'm having the same feelings, anxiety, stress, um, you know, uh, can't breathe, uh, hearts pounding, tears are starting to well up in my eyes. This taxi driver looked at the two of us in the rearview mirror, and he said uh, to my dad, sir, I noticed you're in a lot of pain, and I know you asked me to take you home, but there's this chiropractor down the street and I've heard he helps people like you. Would you like me to take you there? And I was this 19-year-old know-it-all who believes, you know, I know everything. I said no. But dad, being wise, he said, sure, let's try it. Of course, dad was also really terrified of the surgery they were going to do. Right. Long story short, we end up in this chiropractor's office. The guy takes the MRIs that I was carrying, starts looking at the films, and looks at my dad. And he says, I can help you. It's not going to be short and easy. Uh, and comfortable. It'll probably be a long, hard, painful road ahead. But if you don't want to have surgery, I know I can help you. You got to do what I tell you. And, and it, it took it took six months, six months of dad going into that office, 
practically every day. But at the end of those six months, dad walked into that office, walked up to the counter, picked up the pen with his own hand. He signed his own name on the sign in sheet. He could hold a pen again. He could write again. He probably started letters, writing letters to the president all over <laughs> again, you know, and, and uh, um, dad lived another 18 years. He, he lived to be 88 years old and uh, he passed away in 2011. Uh, at 88 though, dad was younger than when he was 70. Wow. He would get up, work out, go out the door, visit his friends. They're all in nursing homes, but not my dad. He's doing a great, you know, living a great life and enjoying his life. Um, dad lived long enough to stand next to me as my best man when I got married. He lived long enough to meet my first son when he was born, got to hold him. And all of that meant so much to me. Um, so, so that's what led me to move towards chiropractic as, as the profession uh, instead of surgery. But then as a chiropractor, I'm noticing more and more, every patient comes up to me and says, you know, doc, it's just stress. If I didn't have so much stress, I wouldn't be so sick and I wouldn't be so hurt and I wouldn't have all these problems. And, you know, to a degree, I agree with them. I, I, I'm not saying they're wrong, um, but is it really the stress or is it how we're managing and handling that stress? Is it, is it our ability or, or inability to tolerate and adapt to the stress? Or is it actually the stress that's out there? And, and so looking at that, I, I, I just went on this journey of studying stress, figuring out what it really means. Most people don't even have the definition of stress. What is it? Everyone goes, oh, I'm so stressed out. What does that mean? That means they're having fights with their children or with their spouse, you know, or, or their boss is yelling at them that they consider that stress. Well, yeah, that does cause stress. But the definition of stress is actually this it's a force it's a force that causes change in your life and so i think that's that's where we can kind of kind of start because that's that's what led me to you know writing the the book i just finished the second book i just started a third book and i know you write a lot as well tom so <laughs> i do i do i do more speaking than writing now because i have a couple books uh, that i've published but uh speaking is right. more my gig with uh, zen commuter now and interviewing uh, interesting people obviously which is great what a great story. That must have uh, must have made you feel just so alive to know that um, that chiropractor, like literally, obviously changed your dad's life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we, without cutting him open, without putting him on more drugs and medication and, and just the quality of life was amazing. Now, do you think people have different set points for stress? Because it seems like some people have the ability to deal with stress and it's just like, yeah, OK, I'm dealing with it. And other people are just like, I can't control this. I am going out of my mind. Yeah, but that, that's a very, very loaded question. Um, the short <laughs> answer is 100 percent yes. In fact, uh, the test, which, which I'm sure you're familiar with, heart rate variability can tell you where that set point for you is. In fact, uh, nowadays, MMA fighters get heart rate variability tests before every workout. Uh, um, you know, it used to be an MMA fighter who's about to go into this big fight and, and it's for a lot of money and there's a lot at stake and they really want to be in their best shape of their life on fight day. They would get injured two weeks before the fight because they're sparring higher level athletes and, and it's causing injuries. And they're like, how do we prevent these injuries? They're going into the fight injured or they have to cancel the fight. So they start doing heart rate variability on people and the heart rate variability, and we can talk about exactly what it does, but it would tell them whether that day they can tolerate stress. So they do the heart rate variability test, and if their score is in the green, they'd say, okay, we're going to train so hard, you're going to throw up in the trash cans in the back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is going to be a hard workout. If they were in the yellow, they would say, okay, we're going to do a light workout today. If they're in the red, they'd say, you go home, you have not recovered from your previous workout. We're going to take it easy. We're not going to do anything today. And so they started doing that and these people stopped having, you know, getting injured we could prevent injury. But, you know, that that set point you're talking about tells you how much you can tolerate before you get sick. Also, you have college students, right? They take final exams. They do a couple of all nighters. They're stressed out. They finish their last final exam. They come down with a sinus infection. It's because that stress was above their set point. Right. Um, how about this? You've, you've got a lot of busy, pe busy people, you know, listening to this podcast right now. They're, they're, they're on the road. They're going to work. They're going to a meeting or whatever. Um, and, and let's say they're planning to go on vacation next week. So what do they do? This week, they work twice as hard <laughs> to, try to get twice the work done because they got to get everything ready and done so that they can go on vacation. And they work a little harder 
if they go above that set point that you mentioned, when they get to paradise for vacation, they're going to be, they're going to have one of those summer colds. What's right. the deal? Why am I sick? I'm on vacation. But that's what happens. So you have to know your set point and then you have to work on increasing that set point. Oh, so there's steps that you can take to increase that set point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nice. You think about um, if, if, if stress is an, if exercise is stress, you know, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you lift a lot of weights. So I can, I can tell, uh, you know, when, when, when you go to the gym and, and you, let's, let's say you, you hit your rep, uh, one rep max, you know, this is the most weight I can lift today. Well, can't you train to be able to lift more sometime later? Maybe right. if you go on a special program and, you know, train for six months or whatever, and then try another one rep max and, and, and you can lift a few pounds more. What'd you do? You just changed that set point. Now your set point went from, I don't know, you probably bench 500 pounds. You know, you went from five. You know, <laughs> 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 it's the same thing, you know, it, it, it's, and, and, you know, here's the statement. If, 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 if no one remembers anything else, but they remember this one thing, how healthy you are depends on how much stress you can handle and how successful you are depends on how much stress you can handle. And, and the quality of your life is determined by how much stress you can handle. So right. if you have a goal, you have a dream, you have a desire, I want to go get a PhD. I want to go for higher education. Well, can you tolerate the stress? Train for it. Raise that set point. You right. say, I want to grow my family. I want five more kids. Yeah. <laughs> you better raise that set. <laughs> high. <laughs> Train for it. Yeah, that's going to be high. You say, I want to start my own business. I want to start my own podcast. You, you know better than anybody else. It's not easy. It's right. not easy to put all this stuff together and, and find the people and interview the people and get the followers and get, and people who are listening, please like, and, and subscribe and all that stuff. That's super important. Um, help us out. But, right. but that that's the point is you've got to figure out what, what set point you need to be at and you have to constantly improve it. I firmly believe there's no such thing as homeostasis. Homeo, the word stasis means you're standing still. You never stand still. It's homeodynamics. It's an ebb and flow, right? You get stressed, you get pushed into one direction and then you push back into the other direction. You constantly move it. And so you, every thought, every action and every decision is gonna move you either toward health or toward illness. You're never standing still. Improve that set point. I love that. I love that. It sounds like you, it, anybody listening to this must be like, you guys must know each other from like way back, like way, way back. Because I say that all the time. There's no neutral. You're either moving forward or you're moving back. And that's definitely the case with stress. And it seems like we're talking about the MMA fighters that um, when we think about stress, we obviously think about stress in our mind. Uh, but as I'm sure you obviously know, stress is everywhere in our body. You know, if you tell anybody stress, where do you feel stress? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, in my head, I am just swimming with thoughts. But it's impacting their body as well. Um, in regards to the MMA fighters, how did they, did they even know um, when you talked about heart rate variability, when you talked about stress, were they like, well, dude, no, I'm fine. I'm not stressed at all. I'm just ready to go. Not knowing that their body was exhibiting the stress, but their mind might not have been. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's an awesome question. So I always say uh, health and stress come in three dimensions. Uh, and, and imagine there's three, three coins. Every coin has two sides, right? So the three coins, one is psychological, which is what you mentioned uh, and described. Uh, and, and the second coin would be physical. And the third coin is chemical or biochemical. And all three have to be addressed. You can't just address one, not the other two, and in expect improvement. So, so the two sides of those coins, the psychological dimension, well, you've got to make sure you're feeding your body with, with good thoughts, positivity, motivation, all of that stuff. I think it's super important. Uh, and, and then you got to avoid the negativity as well. You gotta, so, so watch the news in the morning. Don't watch the news in the evening. Cortisol levels will be high in the morning anyways. So it doesn't matter. That's probably when you drink coffee. It's okay. You can watch the news in the morning, get riled up a little bit. You know, First, to have your quiet time, obviously. So that's important. <laughs> but after that, if you have to watch the news and you need to hear some negative stuff or whatever, you do it in the morning, not in the evening when your cortisol level has to be low. Cortisol, the lower it goes, 
the better you sleep you're going to get. And, nice. and so anyway, so, so that's the two sides. The physical dimension has two sides as well. One would be exercise, uh, posture, exercise, uh, um, just the physical body. And, and uh, the other side of the coin would be rest. You, if you're exercising a lot and not balancing it with rest, that's not going to work so well for you. You right. got to be and the last one is biochemical, right? Biochemical means you have to meet the deficiencies in your body. And whether that means supplementation or food doesn't matter, but you got to feed your body properly. Absolutely properly. Natural, good, organic, healthy stuff. But you also have to avoid toxicity. That's the other side of the coin. So one side of the coin is deficiency. One side of the coin is toxicity. So you, you hit those three dimensions, three coins. Here's the thing. I, I go to this gym and I work out and there's, I've been going there, I don't know, more than 10 years, but there, there's these group of women and you probably have them at your gym who sit on this, on these exercise equipment and they pedal or they're, you know, they're doing the step machine or whatever, but they've been there every day that I've been there and right. they're, they're pedaling for a full hour. They're sweating, you know, but I go, their bodies haven't changed. I mean, it's the same group of women for 10 years. They've been working out for an hour a day, every day. Why aren't they changing? Why, why don't they should look fantastic doing exercising for, you know, for, for 10 years, but they don't. And here's the problem. They're sitting on that exercise bike, reading the magazine. So are the dimensions connected? Right. Because physically they're pedaling, right? But psychologically they're reading the article on the magazine. Right. Well, how's that going to work? What you need to do is connect all three. If you want wellness, all three dimensions have to be improved simultaneously. If you massively improve the physical dimension, but don't address the biochemical and the psychological, you'll get no results. But if you improve all three, just a tiny little bit. So let's say that, that those women on those bikes pedaling in their mind, they're going through their affirmations as they're pedaling and they're visualizing what their body's going to look like as they do this. Every thought has a biophysiologic effect in your entire body. Every thought. Right now, we can close our eyes and visualize the most attractive person standing in front of us. Different chemicals and hormones are going to get released in our body in an instant. Right. We can also close our eyes and worry, which is negative visualization. Imagining worst case scenario, everything's going to go to heck and, uh, and it's going to be awful. You visualize that. All of a sudden, different hormones get released in your body. Different chemical pathways get activated. One breaks you down, one builds you up, one, one is good, one is bad. But you've got to make sure if you're exercising, your mind's in the right place, and obviously you have fed your body properly. That's how those three dimensions are applied. What's well, funny, and you have the perfect analogy because obviously, whether it be uh, women, men, I mean, I've seen guys at my gym, same thing. You know, I've been there for 10 years well, it's like, dude, you you look the exact same as when I saw you 10 years ago. And you, to the, your point, they're either working out really hard, not sleeping, and eating crap or drinking when they're not at the gym. So it's like, yeah, getting that balance of everything in is really going to not just work a body wood, good, but uh, our body well, but obviously our stress levels and our mind as well. Now, what things do you think of in regards to feeding the, uh, well, to take a page from my buddy Eric Zimmer's book, um, Feeding the, the Right Wolf, how do you what steps do you take to become more peaceful with your thoughts? Uh, that's, that's, that's great. I don't have it mastered, you know, <laughs> obviously, um, you know, we, we all get, get attacked. We all get tempted and, and believe it or not, depression and anger are, are follow, follow temptation as well. You, you're tempted to get angry and then you kind of feel good about that, but then you, you have to stop yourself. So you've got to set rules in advance, in my opinion, especially uh, running a business. I, I, I don't have a huge organization. I have 11 employees, not so big. We have a couple of locations and, and, and a few doctors and, and, and we do pretty well. We're growing, we're expanding, but there's always stress. You, you know, you, you've also heard this, you, you know, it, it takes the same amount of energy to think big and think small. So, so you, you, you're doing something small, but you still have the same amount of stress. Um, you got to set the groundwork and the ground rules in advance. You say in the morning, when you wake up, I wonder what good thing's going to happen to me today. Not nice. 
I wonder what kind of crap am I going to have to deal with today? I wonder what kind of bonehead mistake my employees are going to make today. <laughs> if you look for it, you're going to find it. Right, right. Look for the good, you know, expect that everyone's going to do well. You know, you're all on the same team. You want the same thing. And in fact, you know, these people that, that I work with, I brought them here. I hired them. They're my, so, so any, if anything, I should be mad at myself if, if things aren't going right, but you got to look for the good and then decide, Hey, you know, I'll never respond in anger to anything. You, you make that decision because I promise you, you wait a couple hours, 24 hours, things come into perspective. Suddenly you realize, Oh, that wasn't that big a deal. And right. I, I, I can, I can handle it this way. Never respond in anger, never make a phone call in anger. Um, you, you know, uh, never let something get into your soul. Uh, that's, that's not good. You know, I, I, I kind of talk about uh, when I'm with a patient, that's, that's sacred time. And I want everybody who's in my presence to walk away saying, man, it feels good just to be in his presence. <laughs> but, but you, you know, it's, it's, it's something you decide in advance, right? And you rehearse it and you practice it and you get good at it. Like I said, I don't have it all together. But but that's the thing. Now, re remember this too. Music is massively powerful. Breathing techniques, massively powerful, right? Sunlight is massively powerful because of serotonin levels and vitamin D and everything else it does. So there's there's other things. Uh, one of the things I always think about is you can either let your mood dictate your physiology or you can make your physiology dictate your mood because there's it's not possible to frown and smile at the same time. You know, go ahead and try it. Give me a really big frown and then try to smile. You can't, you can't do it. So, so you, you've heard the saying uh, that uh, I'm, I'm not uh, singing because I'm happy. I'm happy because I sing, you know? So, so listen, something goes wrong and, and you get upset. Put your favorite song on and dance to it and get, <laughs> si get silly. Who, who can, I mean, you're going to laugh. You're gonna laugh, and uh, and and then and then you'll put things in perspective. Either way, you got to deal with it. So, right. those are some of the things I do. That's awesome. Now I have to ask this question because of who I am. But uh, and if you don't, that's cool. Every everybody that uh, comes on the show, I ask them if they meditate, of course. And uh, I've had a couple people like, you know, I really been thinking about it. I got to get in there. I'm like, dude, I'm not the like the Nazi. Uh, I'm not the police of meditation. I'm like, it's all so good. But uh, I would imagine, and maybe I'm just uh, thinking that would be the case. But do you meditate currently? Hundred percent. And and the, the meditation I use is visualization. It nice. Is, uh, I, I, I just will take 60 seconds multiple times throughout the day. And it's literally six, 60 to 90 seconds. And, and I just visualize exactly what I want and just stay focused on it. Um, there, there's a breathing technique I'll do that takes a few minutes that, that, uh, that I'll do. And, and, and it, it, it's so simple. It's, I, I breathe in for a count of five, hold my breath for a count of 20 and exhale for a count of 10. So it's a one to four to two ratio. It oxygenates the body. And, and then when exhale is longer than inhale, it leaves the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, pushes you into parasympathetic, which is rest and repair. So I'll do 10 of those breaths. That's meditation. So, so I, I don't like that. I don't want meditation to be an intimidating thing. Right. You can be med it, if our audience has ever picked up a really good book like one of your books and started reading it and they lose yourself, right? They forget where they are and who they are for a few minutes. That's meditation. You right. just left the world and you went somewhere really cool. So why can't you do it? Visualizing. Remember your most favorite vacation spot and remember who you were with and what, what it felt like and what it looked like and really experience it. When you open your eyes, your body will feel like you were there. You, your mind can't tell the difference between something that is actually being experienced and something that was imagined in vivid detail. Didn't Einstein say something about how imagination is the preview of the future to come? So, so there you go. It, it, what are you imagining? Because, because here's the other thing. When you worry, you're meditating also. <laughs> you, you worry about things right. that you don't have control over like the election or, or the stock market, or, you, you know, you sit there and you really worry and then you imagine things and you get all scared and worry. What do they say? The fearful person dies a thousand deaths. Well, that actually is meditation also. So yeah, I'm a big fan of meditation multiple ways of doing it, but you should do it. Everybody should every day. 
<laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> well, as, as I said earlier, as we continue to talk, people are going to be like, these guys must have known each other for like decades because I say the exact same thing, obviously. And uh, it's good to know that you have a meditation practice. But like I said, if you did, you didn't. But, but you bring up a, a great point, too, that whether we're walking in the woods, uh, there are walking meditations, there are, and your book example, I mean, meditation is the training of our brain to focus on one thing exclusively. So if you're reading a book, then just like you said, if you're captivated by that book, you don't know what's going on all around. You're like, wow, this is a really cool book. And you're just focused. So we don't have to put any like labels or definitions to meditation. I mean, I, I do every now and then, but uh, for the most part, it's just finding that one bit of focus. And to your point, even more uh, importantly, is making that focus a positive focus uh, and not a negative one. So where did you learn how to meditate? Read, reading books and experimenting and you know uh wayne dyer was my first exposure to nice and he he has some samples and and audios and now i believe they're all on youtube so everyone can can access them i, I know he passed away recently and it right. was a um, big loss to the world uh, when he passed away but but uh he's the one that started me there was one uh audio uh cd that he had that you you would just sit and say all oh, uh, for an extended period of time and and uh, man it it was good it it, it 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 would change you when you did it every day in fact remembering that right now I'm gonna start doing it again <laughs> <laughs> nice nice I'm glad I brought that to the fore <laughs> now you have um, are, are you aware of Insight Timer no I'm not so I always like telling my guests about Insight Timer so Insight Timer is a free meditation app. But it is wild because Wayne Dyer is on there, obviously, uh, I believe. But it's a variety of meditation teachers with a variety of different practices. One of the things that made me think about you was uh, there's a whole section on visualizations. So um, it's a free app and it's one of the best out there. And I love the fact that it's free because the guys that uh, create it, they're like, you know what? You shouldn't have to pay for meditation. It's like it should be like part of life. And well, it is part of my life. But, <laughs> but definitely check that out. I think you'll like it. Absolutely, I will. Inside time, uh, in insight timer, timer, very cool. And it's funny because it's got a. I remember the first time I heard it, I'm like, insight timer. I'm like, it's a meditation app. I'm like, that's kind of weird name. And I'm like, it's funny because I've been meditating for over 35 years, so I'd never heard about meditating with a timer before. When I meditated, I'm just like, I'm just gonna meditate, and when I'm done, I'm done. Uh, so that's where the timer part comes from. But uh, and before that, I'm like. Who would time their meditation? I thought you just go and then finish when you finish. But that was when I was 18 years old. And I didn't have a lot going on. So <laughs> now it's like, okay, 20 minutes of meditation. Uh, okay, we got this. Uh, yeah, we're good. <laughs> nice, nice. So what is your meditation practice? Do you do it in the morning? You, you said you do it all throughout the day, but do you have a, um, a set time? Morning. Yeah, great. Well, for the most part in the morning, I, I, I get up at five. And uh, first thing I do is, you know, put start on the coffee machine. And uh, do I have a uh, short um, spine related exercise routine that I do it takes me about 17 and a half minutes to do so I do that because I want to do some physical first, right. to kind of just kind of get me away because I don't want to fall asleep in the in the middle of, you know, meditation. But then afterwards is is uh, I, I sit in that quiet and the reason it's early in the morning because I have little kids. Uh, three three boys <laughs> and once they wake up uh, there's all there's bets are off time with that <laughs> so so then i then then i quietly sit there and a, a lot of uh a lot of what i do is also prayer uh i may uh meditate on a verse from the bible mm -hmm. and, and just kind of read it over and over and just really break it down and dig deep into it and figure out what was meant by the author who said this and, and why was, you know, cause you know, I think, I think the, the Bible has, uh, be because it's such an old book. And, and when you look at the, the, um, translations and how, uh, people were so careful about making sure every word is translated the way it's supposed to. And so on, you go, well, then every word must be, must have had a purpose to it. Otherwise they wouldn't have put it in there. And right. so it's a great thing to like, just kind of dig into and, and meditate on. So, so that's, that's a big part of it. But then I, I have seven things that I uh, want to see happen in my life. 
uh, whether they're accomplishments that I want to do, and they, they increase in in um, uh, probability of it happening. You know, this, the seventh one is the the pipe dream. It's it's way out there. It may <laughs> never happen, but it doesn't matter. So I start. I visualize the first one, then the second one, then the third one. And I, I did this a long time ago, where I had picked six things that I would think about nonstop. So if I'm driving, I'm not listening to some. I'm just going to think about these six things because I really. This was when I started my career, very early on. So you know, one was I wanted to pay off my student loans, one hundred eighteen thousand dollars. I wanted to pay it off. Uh, another one was I wanted to meet my wife. Uh, another one was I wanted to have a nice sports car, something I enjoy driving, not the not the Oldsmobile Sierra that I had, the uh, Cutlass Sierra. Uh, and uh, so anyways, so there were six things. And uh, literally five of the six came true. The sixth one almost came true. And it all happened within 18 months. Wow. And it just blew me away that I would just sit there and think about these things and nonstop. And it happened. Now, now I have these seven things that I think about. So that's, that's, that's a big part of my meditation in the mornings. So now, of course, I have to ask, what was the one that got away? So, <laughs> so, so back in the day, uh, there was a guy named Bill. <laughs> Parachute <Phillips>. pants. <laughs> What's that? Parachute pants. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. MC Hammer. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to win this uh, fitness competition where you send in pre and post pictures and, uh, instead of winning, I got, they, they, they said I was in the top 1000, like 200,000 people competed or something. They, I was in the top 1000, never won. And, but they sent me a little leather jacket and a gold pin and things like that. So. Okay. I got to ask, was it body for life? It was. <laughs> I did the same thing. There you go. <laughs> did you win? No, no, no. I didn't get that flashy car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Lamborghini. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Man, that's hysterical. That's awesome. But it was uh, it was a cool process as a total tangent. Uh, did you? Know, I'm I'm sure you enjoyed uh, training for that, right? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that was my my start. That was that was that Body for Life book was my introduction to even weights. I hadn't even picked up a single weight until I read that book. So oh wow, um, yeah yeah. And then ever since then, I've been hooked. I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't ever want to not go to the gym. Oh no, I can't. Like uh, when uh, when COVID hit in March, obviously oh. our gym shut down. So I was like, oh boy, this is not going to be good. So I, obviously I jogged, I did flights of stairs at the university, but yeah. uh, I love working out. So, and I'm sure you're the same way. Yeah. My, my three boys, one weighs 40 pounds, the other 60 pounds, the other's 80 pounds. So I use them as barbells. I, I, <laughs> I lifted my kids. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, how old are your kids? Um, right now they're four, seven and 10. Wow. Those are cool ages. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So when you thought about stress and all the things it does, what made you write the book? Uh, how'd you take it to say, I'm like, okay, you know what? This is pretty impactful. And I want to impact a lot of people. What was the process for you? There are certain things, you know, we have a pretty busy practice. Um, uh, lots of patients, you know, thousands of patients every, every month. And, um, I found myself saying the same thing over and over and over. So I said, I'll just write it down and, and then I'll give everybody a book. So that's, that's, that's why they did that. Now I have severe dyslexia and, and I didn't know this because mm -hmm. throughout school, I always thought I was uh, slow and dumb, but uh, it turned out it's dyslexia and maybe I'm still dumb, but, but it was dyslexia. <laughs> or <And> unwise. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And it, it takes a, you got to be politically correct. It, it takes me a long time to read. So I wrote this thing and I couldn't edit it because every time I'd start reading it, it didn't make any sense and I'd fall asleep. Right. And so I hired someone to read my book to me on the phone and I would edit it verbally. And, and finally it got, it took six years to get done, but it got done. And, and the, the, the premise is, you know, I, I just remember one of the most stressful times in my life was uh, seven years old. We were living in Iran. And one evening my mother said, don't forget to turn on your radio before you go to sleep tonight. And uh, I turned on the radio and, and went to bed and it, it, there was no programming. It's totally silent. And I went to sleep. But after midnight, this loud siren blared through the radio and we all jumped out of bed. We ran out the door. We were staying with a family friend in Tehran. And we, we came out the door, ran down the hallway, ran down the stairs, all the way to the basement of this building where everybody else from the building was waiting. And those were air raid sirens. Then we heard this roar of this jet plane overhead. And then we heard the whistle of a bomb that had just been dropped. And this whistle was just getting louder and louder as the 
bomb is getting closer and closer. And that moment, I remember thinking, well, we can all die. Like this could be the end of it. This is, this is, if, if that bomb hits us, it's, that's a feeling that, that is extreme stress, you know? So your, your pupils dilate, your, your uh, heart's pounding, your, you know, your, your hands are cold, your feet are cold, your face is pale white because blood's leaving your face. There's so many things that happen. So I remember that sensation. And then the, uh, the bomb didn't hit us, obviously I'm still alive. Um, but it was, it was a scary moment. I realized there are people who live like this every day, like that. I only experienced that one night and we went back to our nice home up North by the Caspian sea where like nothing like that ever happened up there. Uh, but people they live like that all the time. I go, how, how did, what happens to their bodies? What happens to their physiology over a long extended period of time? And, and then, you know, for, for people listening today, well, you guys have bombs falling in your life too, because you, you know, divorce, sickness, death. Um, um, getting fired, get, you know, crazy things happening, being sued. I mean, all kinds of stuff can happen. Those are all bombs that are dropping. And then they, they, they stress you out and they worry you. And I want to give people something to do about, about that. So then the, the book came out, it's called The Stress Proof Life. And the, the second book I wrote is called, and that hasn't been published yet, it's called Tame Your Stress Monkey. And uh, now I'm writing a book to entrepreneurs because I found that a lot of entrepreneurs have to decide, do they want health or money? And they feel like they have to, to succeed. They have to burn the candle at both ends and really get sick. And uh, some of them get sick. And then when they're sick, they can't succeed anymore. So their business fails anyways, you know? So, so I'm, I'm trying to tell people, listen, yes, you, you have to be successful. Yes, you have to be healthy, but you've got to figure out how to do both because I firmly believe that, yeah, if you're successful and you're not healthy, you can't enjoy the money that you make and all the freedom and so on. But I also firmly believe if you're healthy, but you, 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 you sacrificed your dreams and your hopes and your goals and your future, that health is worthless too. The right. reason you're healthy is you can pursue your dreams and do great things and create value for people. So anyway, so that's, that's the third book that hopefully will come out in the next few years. Nice. Well, um, it's good to see that you're at work, obviously. So things are still going well for you uh, amidst all this chaos, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, they called us, they, they deemed us uh, essential. So we stayed open. And uh, the goal was to, because a lot of people couldn't go to hospitals and medical offices. Uh, so if they had aches and pains, they had to go to the chiropractor. So we ended up doing okay. You know, we, our numbers went down, but not tremendously. But right. here's, the, here's a leadership lesson. You know, uh, w when those bombs were falling in Iran, I remember I would look at my dad. And if he looked nervous and scared, I would get nervous and scared. If he looked calm, I was calm. So we all have people looking up to us, right? Uh, from a leadership standpoint, if we have an organization with employees or if we run a department or if we're just talking about our families, when, when we say, hey, this is okay, everything's all right, then your employees say that. And so one thing I did was the minute they shut everything down, they said, no one leave your house. I just pulled my staff in and I said, guys, let's assume this is how it's always gonna be forever and ever. How can we adapt? which is what stress management is, adaptation. You adapt to a stressful situation. How can we adapt, change our business structure? How do we make it so that we can still survive, not just survive, but thrive and do great in this environment? And all of a sudden, you know, they saw that I'm not worried. The owner's not worried. I said, I'm not going to lay anybody off. We're going to make it. This is going to be fine. And because of that, they stayed calm. Nobody worried and ended up being okay. <laughs> That's so true. And you made a great point earlier too about how, um, you literally had bombs dropping, but um, as I bring up on Zen Commuter several times, you know, back in the day, our cavemen ancestors, there was a lot of stress. And that's why we have the fight or flight mechanism because there were like marauders coming from another camp. You had wild animals all over the place and uh, it became part of our physiology. Uh, and, you know, when I tell people, I'm like, they're like, well, there aren't any saber tooth tigers anymore. I'm like, yeah, there are. They're just disguised differently. They're the email from your boss. It says, hey, we need to talk. Or it's, uh, you know, your significant other saying, uh, hey, I, I think something's not right. And then you're like, so that saber tooth tiger is like literally right, in, you know, right in your lap. <laughs> so everybody's got stress. Yeah. And then the, the only difference is um, you, you, you get away from the saber tooth tiger and you're okay, but you get away from your boss, you still think about it. And yeah. you, 
you relive that moment over and over like a bad movie. You play it again and again and again in your mind and it eats you up. And then you go to sleep at night or you try to go to sleep. You can't sleep because the same thought is circulating in your brain over and over and over. Well, that's because your body stayed in fight or flight. Right, right. So, exactly. So that fight or flight is supposed to be short term. Long term, it causes a whole host of other issues like not being able to sleep. By the way, do that breathing exercise and uh, you'll be able to fall asleep. Uh, when you're in that situation. Um, uh, but, but also um, food cravings. You think about how uh, initial short-term stress, let's say it lasts a few days, you start having massive sugar cravings, but then you, your body starts to crave fat and sugar when it lasts longer. So, so if your cravings have switched from uh, Skittles and M&Ms to ice cream and donuts, it's because your body needs triglycerides now because you're burning through some of your uh, adrenals and, and hormones and so on. And then what happens is at the end of it, when you're exhausted, because first you're wired, then you're wired and tired. And then at the end of it, now you, you're, you're in adrenal fatigue, you've depleted your whole body. Now you fall asleep when you're, you know, sitting in a classroom, you fall asleep when you're watching an, even an exciting movie, you keep falling asleep, you're tired, your cravings are now you still want the ice cream and donuts, but now you crave salty foods like pretzels and potato chips as well, because your adrenal glands need the, the salt and the minerals in your diet. So, so pay attention to those food cravings because they all mean something. Oh, that is interesting. Uh, I'll think about that the next time I'm hankering for lasagna or mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing to point out too, is that I bring this up to my listeners all the time is that sometimes people are under so much stress that they don't understand that there is anything else. So that, you know, they're going on stress, 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 and it becomes their norm. It becomes their default. So when you ask them, Hey, are you stressed? And they're like, no, I'm fine. Yet their body's saying, Oh, can I answer this? Cause you're not fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's the thing is you have to watch. So that could be the person who's, who's eating a lot of junk food because of their food cravings, but, but they're able to keep going, but it's because they're, they're, they're getting that energy somehow. Yeah. Right. I'll give you an example. Um, house catches on fire and uh, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a single mom and she realizes the house is burning down. So she'll run and grab the kids and she gets superhuman strength in that moment and picks up all three kids by herself, carries them out of the house, puts them down, runs back in, gets the cat and the dog and pulls them out, runs back in, gets the photo albums and the, the, the sentimental things through the fire, grabs them, brings them back. And then the fire department shows up. Fire department shows up. She looks around. She realizes the kids are safe. Everything's okay. And, uh, and, and the, they're putting the fire out and all of a sudden she collapses, she passes out, you know, but she was, she did fine during that time. That's the metaphor for the CEO or the busy salesperson or whatever, who's burning that candle long-term and, and eventually they're going to hit the, the, the bottom. They're, they're still going to crash. Right. You've got to be training like that MMA fighter trains. You've got to be thinking, how can I increase my capacity and ability to do this? You look at Army Rangers, you look at Marines, you look at SEAL Team. Uh, um, these, these people, can they sleep 20 minutes and they function 10 times higher than I could ever function at my best. 24 hours, they sleep tw 20 minutes and they keep going. They, they accomplish these great... They didn't get there like that. You, if you tell me only sleep 20 minutes and, and I'm going to put you in, in the middle of the jungle and you're going to go rescue some POW, uh, man, yeah, it's not going to happen because I haven't trained for it. Train for what you want. Train for it. Think about, hey, who do I need to be? What do I need to believe? How do I need to perform? What are the goals and what, sorry, what are the uh, gifts and talents and skills that my body needs to succeed at this? You got to start with the end in mind, right? Stephen, right. Covey, who do I need to be? Who's the person that can do these things? And then how do I become that person? You start working towards that and, and you'll, you'll succeed and you won't end up crashing. Yeah. And that's uh, that reverse engineering is a really important part because uh, sometimes people get overwhelmed when they're starting They're They're at the starting point, looking at the end, they're like, Oh, there are 9 million steps. <laughs> I'm like, no. Okay. Just break it down. Small, tiny, tiny, tiny. Yeah. Now with your uh, breathing technique, you take a 20 minute rest uh, at that hold 
uh, or 20, uh, 20 count for that hold? Yeah, 20 count. You can count as, as um, fast or as slow as you want. Uh, but it, it's got to be like a metronome. It's got to be the same rhythm. So, uh, and the ratio is all that matters. So right. it, it can be yep. a count of 5, 20, and 10. It can be 7, 28, 14. It doesn't really matter. Count as fast or as slow as you want, as long as you maintain the rhythm. So here's what, what it is, is, is however long it took you to inhale, uh, it takes four times as long to get all the oxygen or as much of the oxygen as possible out of the air that you put into your lungs. Because only the part of the air that touches the, the lining of your lungs, the alveoli, that actually uh, transfuse oxygen into your blood, the rest of it, that's why mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing works, is because most of the air you exhale still has a lot of oxygen in it. But if you hold on to that air in your lungs for a count of four times what it took you to take it in, you get as much as you possibly could out of that. So you oxygenate your body and then the exhale process. So that has to be twice as long. So anytime your body is stressed, you're worried, you're nervous, breathing becomes a one-to-one -one ratio because if something crazy just happened, let's say you and I are talking, all of a sudden the ground started shaking, the ceiling tile started falling on my head and we're in the middle of an earthquake. The first thing I'm gonna do is not breathe a sigh of relief. I'm gonna gasp a big inhale. That's a sign of stress. In, in fact, you, you, you study Wim Hof breathing, you know, where he, he, can, he can walk through the Arctic with nothing but his underwear and, and run marathons and all and hang off a cliff by his fingernails. It's because he activates his fight or flight syndrome by breathing a specific way. Big, hard inhales activate sympathetic response. It actually makes you stronger. It makes your temperature different. It, you know, releases adrenaline. The opposite of that is a long, slow exhale. Hey, it wasn't an earthquake. Someone's putting a prank on me. You breathe that sigh of relief. So you want exhale to be twice as long as inhale to balance the sympathetic parasympathetic response. Now that's interesting. I'll have to do some reading on that because obviously as a meditator, I always knew that, you know, the double um, triggers the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, but I didn't, I didn't even think I'm like, oh yeah, if you want to. And as a meditator, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like why would you want to do that? But yeah, I guess if you want to run through the Arctic in your underwear, then you probably need to do something. <laughs> How you do that? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Absolutely. You know awesome. What, let, let me mention this since you said that is, is, you know, people risk their life to climb mountains too, um, K2 and, and Mount Everest. And there's some crazy statistic, like one out of seven people die and never make it back alive. And, and, uh, one out of 12 people ever even summit, or I don't know the numbers I'm making it up, but it's, but it's staggering and it's scary. And you go, why do people put themselves through that where they have to deal with the high altitude and low oxygen? and the extreme cold temperature and the physical brutality of climbing up this mountain, going through tr terrain that's treacherous and then risking falling through the ice and all this stuff. Why do they do it? Is it just because they want a picture at the summit? Because you can super superimpose yourself on a picture exactly. and act like you made it, but why do they do it? It's because the guy that comes back down the mountain is not the same person that went up the mountain. That's a good point. That, that person is different and it changes you, which is why I always encourage if you're looking at something and you're going, this is too hard to do. That's exactly the reason to do it. If you're looking exactly. at something going, this mountain is too tall to climb. That's why you should do it. John F. Kennedy said, let's, let's go to the moon. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. That's a real reason. That's a valid reason. Right. Because you become a different person. Now you've conquered that mountain. You're, you could, you know, your bills don't look overwhelming anymore. Your, your marital issues don't seem as difficult anymore. You go, I'm the guy who survived. I just, I just climbed Matt, the Matterhorn. I'm like, I'm please, the, the electric bills due two months ago. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> what are they going to do to me? <laughs> exactly. I was already cold before. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, so how do people go about uh, following you to keep up to date on your books and all the different things you're talking about in regards to stress? Uh, the first book is on Amazon, so you can just search for uh, my name, Amir Rashidian, or uh, Stress Proof Life. Um, uh, we have a YouTube channel called Real Chiropractic, oh, and uh, we regularly put videos, you know, stories of our patients and things like that on that, um, uh, teach people exercises to do, so on. And uh, then I have two websites. One is called uh, drrashidian.com, and the other is called midatlanticclinic.com, and both of those have some good good information. Our Facebook page is pretty neat too. We usually post stuff on that too. And that's, that's mid Atlantic clinic. Okay, cool. Well, I'll be uh, reaching out to you. In fact, uh, uh, when we end this, I'll get your email address so I can get all those, um, all those links into the show notes for you.
Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I guess I think I have an answer for this anyway, but uh, I, I have a question that I ask all my guests, regardless of whether they're accountants, whether they're meditation teachers, whether they're Buddhists. And that is, if you had the attention of absolutely everybody in the world, what would you want the world to know? And most people hate me when I ask that question because you could have kind of given me this ahead of time so I could think about it. <laughs> I want the world to know that uh, you have to live a life that you're going to enjoy. And so understand that if there's something you don't enjoy, you put it there, you created it, and you can change it. Now, now whether it's you change how you're looking at it, or you can actually change it or however it is, but you, you do have a lot of power and you do have a lot of strength and you were designed to adapt. You were designed to grow into the challenges of your life. So meet it with joy, meet it with positive expectation. Uh, believe in yourself. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the world is a, is a gigantic miracle. That's why you can get, uh, put, a, put green grass in a brown cow that gives you white milk that turns into yellow butter. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it's a miracle. Every, <laughs> everything's a miracle. Everything is fantastic. Everything is wonderful. Open your eyes. See how wonderful you are, how powerful you are. Go after the challenges and, and go for it with, with expectation that even if you fail, you're going to become a better person. So it's truly never, never a failure. That is awesome. See, I, I didn't need to give you a primer. I didn't need to tell you, hey, I'm going to ask this in about an hour, just so you know. <laughs> you knocked it out of the park. <laughs> well, Amir, thank you so much for our time today. You know what? I will put this as the uh, step, the, the, the editing point, and we're just talking now, just you and I. So, okay. uh, But, uh, dude, thanks so much. That was a great, great talk. My pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have 19 other uh, patients to see today? <laughs> got a few yeah it, it starts in about 10 minutes i think we have about 60 or 70 people this afternoon oh damn <laughs> wow just a small little place huh yeah <laughs> <laughs> now where are you guys located um frederick maryland oh okay so frederick so frederick maryland's uh central time zone no we're eastern oh well, it's weird because uh, when uh, James sent me the thing, he's like, uh, can you meet at uh, one o'clock central time? Uh, I said, yeah, I can. I'm like, so I thought you were like in Chicago or. Uh... No, no, no. I'm right outside of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. Oh, yikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just got to say, good luck with that. <laughs> exactly. Nice. Well, hey, I won't keep you. I know you got a lot to do, but uh, let's stay in touch because I really enjoyed our talk today. And, uh, For sure. Uh, we are definitely birds of uh, birds of a feather for sure. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much. That was great. You got it. You have a great day, Amir. You too. Take care. Peace.